Hello everyone. Today, I'm going to be doing an in-depth analysis of Metro 2033. As a result, there is going to be heavy gameplay and story spoilers throughout, so I would recommend playing the game before watching. I will, however, attempt to only spoil the aspects of the game that I feel are relevant to my analysis. So, if you haven't played the game yet, you can still watch on without having the whole thing ruined for you. Metro 2033 is a 2010 game released by Ukrainian developer 4A Games, which follows the plot of Russian author Dmitry Gulkovsky's book of the same name. The game is set in a post-apocalyptic Moscow, where the survivors are forced to live in underground tunnels of the Moscow Metro due to the fallout of nuclear bombs that have hit all over the globe's surface. The game follows a young man called Artyom, who sets out to save his station from mutants and telepathic creatures known as the Dark Ones. The game itself is an interesting mix of survival horror, stealth FPS gameplay, and a narrative roller coaster, with the primary hook being an incredibly realized world. The game starts out with a flash forward to what will eventually turn out to be the end of the game. The scene effectively manages to draw the player into the world, and gives a pretty good overview of what the player should expect from the rest of the game. In this short prelude, the player is exposed to the Dark Metro Underground, complete with dilapidated architecture, gets an introduction to the basics of ammo conservation and scavenging, gets to be shown off some of the horror aspects of the game, and gets to see the state of the world outside. Overall, I'd say this section manages to introduce the player to both the world and serve as a quick tutorial without being overly intrusive. However, I would say it's arguable whether or not this section should have been put here, or where it fits into the timeline chronologically. But overall, I wouldn't say it takes away from the game too much of its stands. One aspect of this flashback scene that I do feel feels a little bit out of place on repeat playthroughs is some of the stuff that Miller says to Artyom in this bit. Так, так. Похоже, никого нет дома. Не забудь надеть противогаз перед выходом на поверхность. Без него ты долго не протянешь. Мы почти на месте. Это концертный зал. Отсюда до башни два шага. Considering what's happened before this part of the game, it's a bit strange that he's instructing Artyom on how to put on a gas mask and why you'd want to do it. Before this scene, they've traversed the surface before, and have just come up from an area filled with toxic fumes, so it makes no sense for Miller to tell Artyom about putting on a gas mask now instead of earlier. While overall this is a pretty inconsequential part of the game, it makes me wonder why they ended up deciding to put this part at the start instead of where it fits chronologically. In this video, I'll be playing the original release of Metro 2033, and this area also showcases one of the less appealing parts of that version of the game, the frame rate. If you're playing the game on high or lower, the frame rate pretty much scales just as you would expect. On my current rig, I managed to get around 60 FPS or more on high, but as soon as I change the settings to very high, my frame rate drops in half. For a game released six years ago, this seems to be little more than a lack of optimization rather than anything else. What makes this cut even deeper is the fact that there is no way to change the individual settings from the game, and you can only go through the presets of low, medium, high, or very high. This means I can't say, change the ambient occlusion to a lower setting or turn off motion blur without lowering everything else. I believe that these settings are tweakable from the CFG files and that the Redux version of the game fixes this issue, but it's still an issue for those who want to play the game in its original carnation. Just a quick note on why I'm playing the original instead of Redux is due to the fact that Redux brings a bunch of elements from Last Light back into the original game and also puts a lot of extra post-processing and filters that I don't really like. It changes the mood of the game to be much different from the original. There are a couple of benefits, like, as I said, better frame rate, but aside from that, I'd say go with the original version if you're looking to get one of these. Following this scene, we move back to the start of the story, and are introduced to Artyom Station, the threat of the Dark Ones, the threat of the other mutants, and Hunter, who kicks off Artyom's story. The scene effectively establishes the stakes of the plot, and gives Artyom a reason to brave the dangerous tunnels and set out for Polis. In these early scenes, you'll notice that I'm actually using the Russian voice acting. While I find that the English voice acting is generally good enough, 
can often sound a bit flat or out of accent at times, which takes away from what's going on. Overall, I'd say that the Russian voice acting seems to be superior in delivery and lip sync, and I would highly recommend it if you feel like reading the subtitles of the whole game. However, for the majority of this video I'll be using English voice acting, as I find it easier to listen to what's going on rather than read it. In addition, not all the ambient conversations are actually subbed, so you might miss out on some stuff if you can't actually speak Russian. Finally! Taking your time as usual, huh? Alright, grab your gear, go to the platform, they're waiting for us. I'll meet you there. Hey, Artyom, don't forget anything, huh? Exhibition Station is the first point in the game where the player really gets to have a wander around. The path that the player takes is fairly short and quite linear, but it's packed to the brim with stuff that makes the metro feel like a living, breathing place where these people work, sleep, and live. Walking through, the player can hear people talking about their lives, ranging from conversation topics about new music acquired from a ranger, to arguments between partners, to a father reassuring a child. The optional conversations with Artyom's stepfather, or the one by the guitar player, are excellent mood setters. Have a listen. Do you think one day we could go back up to the surface? I've never seen Moscow, just the old pictures. Moscow's gone. Soon we'll be gone too. And the monsters will inherit the Earth. But there were other subways. St. Petersburg, Minsk, Kiev. People might have survived somewhere else, or at least for a while. But so many years have passed now, and we've heard nothing from them. The other cities didn't have defense rings like Moscow did. What a great city it was, St. Petersburg. The cathedral and the admiralty with its spire. I remember summer nights in Nevsky Avenue, the crowds, laughter, kids with ice cream. Slender girls, the music, and the air sweet enough to drink. What a beautiful world we've destroyed. Many of these conversations do nothing more than make the place feel more alive, but many of them allude to places outside the station. For instance, the player can stop and have a listen to an announcement that an alliance between Exhibition and Riga is taking place, which gives some sense of the politics that exist in the Metro. The level designers have made sure that the people of each station have a place to eat, sleep, work, drink, prepare food, and so forth. If the player is really interested, they can even see what these people eat, how it's grown, and so forth. All the footage of the game that you'll be seeing will come from the Ranger Hardcore difficulty, which I believe shows the game in the best possible light. The lack of a HUD and other elements not only add to immersion, but also manage to declutter the screen and add elements of tension to any gunfight. While the player is able to get an idea of the amount of ammo they currently have loaded in a weapon by looking at the model itself, the amount of reserve ammo the player has is not readily available. This means, when the player is in combat, they are provided with three main choices when using ammo. Firstly, they can take the time to check out how much ammo they have by pulling out the watch or journal, which takes up time and stops the player from being able to shoot. Secondly, they could keep firing with the same weapon and try to keep count of how much ammo they're going through. Or thirdly, they could switch to another weapon while firing if the player thinks they're going to run out of ammo early. This adds an extra tactical element to the game that the player has to consider throughout the entire experience. This also makes the game feel much more unique and gunfights way more tense. The Ranger Hardcore difficulty also lowers the health for not only the player, but also for enemies, to the point where combat encounters tend to result in one-shot, one-kill rules. These exchanges tend to be much slower and more tenser experiences, similar to Red Orchestra 2 or the Armor series, and this tension works wonders with the rest of the game. Whatever. Moving on, the player manages to take their first trip out into the dark tunnels with the caravan. While this scene has little to offer in terms of gameplay aside from a short turret section, it manages to really set more of the scene and give the player exposure to the horror part of the game. While some people have issue with these sort of, uh, beg the expression, on rails sections of the game, I feel that Metro does an excellent job with them. For the most part, they are very tense and spooky parts of the game. Aside from the well executed set pieces that make up these scenes, the cart rides manage to stay within the core systems of the game. Aside from the gunplay, exploration, and stealth sections of the game, 
One of the core systems in the Metro games is resource conservation, particularly ammo conservation. Ammo is really scarce in the Metro, which means that the player has to be really careful with how many rounds they use in combat encounters. This means that every bullet that the player uses adds to the feeling that they're using up a limited resource. Now the genius is that aside from the horror atmosphere, these railcar rides manage to be kept interesting by the fact that, with one notable exception, the player has to use the same ammo that they use in the rest of the game. Because of this, and the overwhelming amounts of enemies in these sections, it never truly feels like the player ever has the upper hand on the railcar rides, and therefore creates tension. The railcar sections also ensure that the player use up large portions of their ammo, which prevents them from hoarding it. The game amazingly manages to make the player feel like they could run dry during the next firefight throughout the entire game. Alright boys, let's train to our friend Artyom, who goes right through monsters and anomalies alike. To Artyom. To, Ar to you! Hey, boy. Hey, boy. Hell, if not for you, Artyom, we'd have been shredded like cabbage. You deserve a medal. <laughs> or at least some extra ammo. Here, take them. To you. Artyom! After encountering some ghosts and having a round of drinks with a really buggy cup, the player manages to get another short period of station exploration in Riga. Functionally, each of the populated towns are pretty much identical, all housing various vendors for the player to purchase weapons and supplies from. However, each station still manages to have a unique feel to it. Exhibition is dense and vastly populated, Riga is smaller, and characterized by narrow alleyways between rail cars, market has large amounts of traders, armory is very industrialized, and polis is very large, open, and grand. Riga is also the first location where the player is faced with an obvious moral choice, whether or not to pay the child to guide the player to Bourbon, or not. Metro 2033 features an obscure moral system, where certain acts are awarded positive moral points, while others are awarded negative moral points. How many points the player collects changes which ending the player is allowed to choose in the final moments of the game. This system is entirely optional, and one can easily go through the game without even knowing it's there. At no point is it actually explained to the player, and is only alluded to during some select interactions with Khan. Overall, I like the idea of the system being hidden, as it removes many of the experimenter effects that would be present if the player knew that their actions were being judged. Moving forward, the player ends up forming a pragmatic alliance with Borben, who at first appears untrustworthy, but quickly becomes likeable due to his dialogue. During this section, Borben and Artyom travels through some pretty spooky tunnels, and is introduced to some of the more advanced aspects of the game systems, including stealth and trap evasion. Traps in Metro are fairly straightforward, and are pretty easy to see because they're placed in pretty obvious locations. The presence mostly serves to keep the player on their toes, and it works fairly well. There are a couple of places where an off-guard player might get caught by one. The stealth aspects of the game, however, are a bit more hit and miss. Limited amounts of ammo and lethal damage of bullets go a long way to encourage the player to attempt to stealth through as many areas as they possibly can, as doing so saves both ammo and exposes their character to as little harm as possible. The game also gives a fairly nice framework for stealth, with silent tools such as throwing knives and silenced weapons, an obvious visibility indicator on Artyom's watch, and the ability to turn off or shoot out lights. However, once Artyom's spotted, it's pretty much impossible to be able to go back to stealth, as even if the player hides for an extended period of time, it seems like the enemies still know where you are. Because of this, if it's spotted, the player is forced to return to the last checkpoint or go loud. Thankfully, the stealth is actually pretty easy, and the combat's enjoyable, so it's not as big of an issue as it could potentially be. As Artyom and Bourbon move towards Market, the game continues to move between different set pieces, from stealth to quiet exploration to fending off some Nosaluses. Once more, the limited amount of ammo both manages to keep the tension high during these scenes, but also encourages the player to move off the beaten path to find some extra supplies. It's worth noting that, due to severe darkness in the metro tunnels, Artyom's head torch is an incredibly important tool for getting around without stubbing your toes. In addition to navigation, the torch lets the player to see enemies and ghosts before they get close enough to be of any danger, which makes it important to always have this on in dark areas. Interestingly, 
the designers have managed to make the torch drain the player's resources without having the player get themselves stuck in a corner where they can't see anything because they ran out of a battery. In order to keep the torch charged, the player needs to leave themselves vulnerable and pull out the charger. The charger not only helps add to the tension of the game by requiring the player to frantically squeeze the trigger of their torch while they're in a scary area, but it also adds to the immersion, as each trigger squeeze equates to a mouse click. I'm a fan of all these little touches in Metro that give this sort of extra immersion, such as having to manually put on and change gas masks and filters, or being able to pick up ammo directly off dead people's uniforms and see that happen in real time. After a tense escape from some mutants, we arrive at Market Station, and are treated to some more character development from Bourbon. Once inside, we get to explore another station and are told to buy some filters. One notable conversation in this area comes from a radio operator. This is Moscow Metro, over. What kind of look? Does anyone read me? Please respond. I'm meeting her today after the watch. There should be survivors in St. Petersburg. Some of the metro stations are even deeper than ours. I went there once when I was young. There were these huge iron gates that opened when the train arrived. Along with the train's door. The great thing about these ambient conversations is that they are done in such a way that could only work in a game. If there were too many of them, a book or movie would drag on for far too long if all were included. However, in a computer game, the player can pick up and choose whether to listen to all, some, or none of these. Considering we're talking about Market Station, now's an excellent time to give an overview of how the game handles economy. What the people in the metro exchange for goods and services are military-grade rifle rounds, or MGRs. These rounds were produced before the nukes fell on Moscow and deal large amounts of damage and are highly valuable. These rounds can be traded for lower quality, dirty rounds in stations. Dirty rounds were made in the metro and deal less damage but are far more plentiful. In addition, any ammo that you find in your adventures can be exchanged for MGRs. MGRs can be exchanged for better weapons or other equipment such as gas masks and filters. Because MGRs are the primary currency, and any ammo type can be sold for MGRs, Every shot that the player fires, be it MGR or dirty rounds, are effectively meaning that the player is shooting their money. This leads to a number of choices that the player can make while in combat. Firstly, they can try to avoid shooting altogether by stealthing through areas. Secondly, they can use less effective, but cheaper, dirty rounds. Or thirdly, they can use their money to deal large amounts of damage, but miss out on buying ammo and upgrades later on. This creates a large amount of depth in the combat and economy aspects of the game both of which increases player choice, which improves variety and replayability. After buying some supplies, Artyom and Boardman head up to the surface. Before doing so, we get to have a look at how seriously stations treat leaving and entering, as opening the gates requires all the guards present to ready themselves. It's easy to imagine that trips up to the surface are not a common occurrence, and if these guards and doors weren't present, the stations would clearly have a snowball's chance in hell at surviving. Once on the surface, we quickly get separated from Bourbon, and the player gets their first chance to explore the surface on their own. These areas have a lot of focus on exploration, and the player is free to explore the area at their own pace. The buildings that Artyom has to progress through have a number of secret rooms and traps to navigate, with some good gear hidden around the place for inquisitive players to find. Although we're out in the sunlight, the player still feels vulnerable due to the constant threat of monsters. Even when the player is in no danger, constant howls keep the player on edge. Infrequent gunshots also give the feel that Bourbon may not be faring as well as the player. At this point in the game, the player also experiences some of the more vivid visions of the past, the cause of which at this point is unknown. Interestingly, after the flashback in the playground, the player can actually see a dark one scuttle off, which is a detail I missed on my first time through. An amazing piece of game design is the gas mask. Whenever the player is on the surface, or in an area with toxic gas, the player is required to wear their gas mask in order to breathe. The thing is, the gas mask requires filters to work, and these filters will wear out over time. This means that the player has to hold on to a constant stock of filters to be able to make it through these areas. This gameplay element causes two major things. One, it encourages the player to search the surface for filters, and two, 
It adds a constant pressure for the player to progress so they can avoid running out of air. This ticking timer is constantly on the player's mind while they're on the surface, and it makes the entire time the player is there a tense experience. Despite a feeling of almost always running out of filters, a player moving through the game at a reasonable rate will never really run out. The developers have seemed to be able to have mastered the act of placing just the right amount of equipment around so that the player will always have it just enough while always feeling like they're about to run out. This is a design philosophy that dates back to games such as the original Resident Evil, which managed to create tension through limiting the amount of resources while still ensuring that the player would never run out. When the player finally makes their way back underground, the feeling of relief is enormous as they no longer have to worry about their filters. The fact that the gas mask will break when shot stops the player from wearing it the whole time as well. After meeting back up with Bourbon and making a mad escape from a swarm of mutants, we end up back inside the metro. Bourbon ends up being captured by some bandits, which leaves the player with an opportunity to sneak through a bandit controlled station alone. There's not really too much to say about this area, other than there's a really well designed stealth encounter. Interestingly, if the player progresses slowly enough, which they will if they're trying to stealth through, some of the guards will be silently killed by Khan during this encounter. I feel that this is done in an excellent manner to foreshadow the next chapter of the story. Eventually, Artyom parts way with Bourbon, and instead tags along with one of the more interesting characters in the game, Khan. Khan's part of the game contains some of the most foreboding and interesting parts of the story, so I'm not going to show any of it here, as to not lessen their impact or value. All I'll say is that this part of the game stayed with me a long time after it was over. Note that this is also part of the game where Khan alludes to the morality system, and warns the player to think about things before they make their judgement. In place of talking about Khan's part of the game, I'm going to take the time to talk about some of the game's music. The music in Metro 2033 is excellent in setting the mood for each part of the game. The music ranges from acoustic guitar pieces by citizens of the Metro, to dark and brooding ambient music that brings out the strangeness and horror of the setting. The soundtrack has never had an official release, which is a shame due to the sheer quality of it. Listen to a sample of the following piece, without any associated images. clearly brings to mind, for me at least, a dark underground area and feels almost like there's an evil presence. The piece manages to make the player feel uneasy or even frightened without the rest of the game even happening, so when it's included in the game, the results are terrifying. The next piece I'll show you has a very different quality. This is a simple acoustic piece that really brings out the melancholy feel that many of the citizens of the metro must be feeling. <laughs> Overall, the music in this game is excellent, with the foreign and unique aspects of the game really being brought out. While not officially available, rips from the game's files are available from the internet. Eventually Khan and Artyom arrive at Curse Station. The retrieval of the bomb and detonation of the tunnels lead to an interesting gameplay scenario where the player is encouraged to retreat back to the main platform of the station when overwhelmed, where Khan and co will attempt to take out the mutants. This creates a fantastic stop-start fight that is not really seen in the rest of the game. The run down the tunnel away from the ticking time bomb is also a nice moment.
The only real issue I have with this area is the location of the bomb. Our team is told that the tunnel that needs to be collapsed is the left tunnel, and has given no indication that the dead bomb crew will be in the right tunnel. This can lead to the player slugging their way up through the left tunnel, only to find that they have to go all the way back when they can't find the bomb. The almost completely over on station also shows what can happen to inhabited station if everything goes wrong. This not only enhances the already bleak atmosphere, particularly after the events of the previous chapter, but also clearly shows to the player what could happen to their home station of exhibition if they fail to get help, clearly showing what's at stake. As Khan puts it, Doom has already arrived. After the battle's over, and the tunnels have been exploded, Khan stays behind to help the people of Cursed Station, so Artyom parts ways to continue on to Polis. As they do so, there's a nice moment in a shrine where they say their goodbyes, and Artyom is told to move on to Armory Station. A shrine to hope. Even in these times, we can't relinquish the things that make us human. That's it. Get in. Remember, everything depends on you and you alone. Until we meet again, goodbye, Artyom. After the player walks into the station, we get our first real introduction to the Reds. Careful, kid. Our free station is under the watchful eye of the Reds. Paranoia is the new game in town, so keep yourself below the radar. You understand? Just some friendly advice. After a thrilling chase, a short break to buy some more supplies, and a first class train seat ride, the player ends up at the front line of a war between the Reds and the Nazis. Interestingly, both sides have the officers and leaders depicted in a fairly negative light. While the regular foot soldiers are treated as more sympathetic characters who have been roped in by the circumstances. No one side is really depicted as good or bad guys, but overall I'd say the Reds come off better. This all ties into the more dark, gritty, and somewhat more realistic tale that Metro tries to tell. Metro doesn't have any cackling villains, and it's more of a tale of a place than anything else. This whole level can be played as one long stealth section if the player wishes, with multiple ways to progress. The player can even attempt to rescue some Soviet soldiers who have been captured by Nazis if they feel they're up to it. If the player finds them, this is also an excellent area to make use of the night vision goggles. These hook into the same charger as the flashlight, but allow the player to see without making themselves stick out like a sore thumb to the AI. The trade-off is that the player suffers from a smaller field of vision and emits an audible noise that may attract any nearby soldiers. Overall, they can be useful, but only in particular areas. Most of the time I find the torches preferable. After making it through this area, and then getting beat up by some Nazis, the player gets to meet some rangers for the first time since their initial encounter with Hunter. These guys are immediately likeable, in no small part due to the fact that they just saved your ass. Next, we get the one exception rail car ride I mentioned earlier. In this ride, the player uses a mounted MG that doesn't use any of the player's ammo. This means that the ride loses a lot of the tension that the others have. It's by no means bad, but it loses some of its appeal on repeat playthroughs. The slow turning controls don't really help to make it any more appealing either. After the ride ends and a short work, we end up in a second cart, this time with your own gun. This ride is much better than the last one, and it introduces crouching to avoid low obstacles and bullets. It also has a much thicker horror atmosphere, and has all the tension of using your own ammo. In particular, I find entering the depot is a really cool moment. The depot! I've heard so much about it. So that's what it looks like! After the ride ends, we get some quiet time to explore a little bit. These little bits of quiet time are very important, as they give the player some time to take a breath from the action and contemplate what events had just unfolded. Overall, one of the biggest strengths of Metro is the amount of quiet time it gives the player, which gives the game some great pacing and accentuates the action. When I think of Metro, I don't immediately think of the frantic fights or the railcar rides. I think of slowly creeping through a quiet tunnel trying to keep my torch charged, or quietly exploring the surface for supplies while hearing howls in the distance. Soon enough, the player comes across Hull Station and the Children of the Underground. The captain gives a rousing speech that quickly gives the player motivation to defend the station. 
It's made immediately clear that the player and the nearby soldiers are all that stand between the Nosaluses and an otherwise defenseless station. The game does an excellent job of building up the tension for what will be a long and intense firefight. Damn, 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 damn! During this fight, many Nosaluses that the player misses can actually be seen jumping over the barricade, presumably to attack any civilians that are still left in the station. I found that I felt a pang of guilt for every one of these things that I noticed get past my defenses. After the battle, the player awakens to find out that the defense failed and that the Nosaluses ransacked the station. The mortally wounded captain gives the player a message to broadcast and the player is left to traverse through the decimated station alone. The station is a harrowing sight, with carcasses of humans and beasts lying about. Ammo and casings lying all over the place, and threshed about furniture, all seem to add to a sense that the last stand was made here. Once again, the player is left to see firsthand what could happen to Exhibition if they fail. Making it through the station, the player comes across a stranded little boy and Artyom takes it upon himself to save him. This leads to the better of two escort sections in the game. Instead of having to worry about the boy following you around or running out of health, the game simply has Artyom carry him on his shoulders, alleviating most of the escort from the escort mission. However, in this section, the game adds extra inertia to the player's mouse movements, which creates the impression of carrying extra weight. The short section doesn't last too long, but the extra challenge of having to shoot small, fast-moving enemies while dealing with the extra inertia is an interesting challenge. These guys really aren't too hard to hit, so it doesn't make it impossible or anything. I'm not sure how much it shows in the video, but the extra momentum for each movement really changes the way the game plays. The child's voice acting isn't all that crash hot, but his reaction when he sees the sky is pretty memorable. Wow, what's that up there? Wait, Uncle showed me a picture once. The the sky! That's the sky, isn't it? It's like a painted ceiling. I'll be, I'll be famous. Uh, I sold the sky! It also really hits home here how many people in the metro might not have ever even seen the sky, or the outside world at all. Speaking of bad voice acting, the mother of the child doesn't really have the best in the game. Despite that, reuniting the child with his mother is still a pretty powerful scene. The short talk from the soldier helps bring the scene together, and the sight of refugees in the tunnel is one of those aspects of the game that really brings the metro to life. Heading back out on the surface brings back continuous tension of slowly running out of filters. As with most of the areas in the game, the surface area is really well laid out, with various amounts of equipment being hidden all over the shop. In general, the above ground parts of the game tend to be more open and, forgive the expression, less railroaded than their underground counterparts. As the player shoots their way through some Nazis, dodges some demons, and broadcasts a message, they eventually make it back to the underground. In this station we meet back up with Ullman, the other ranger from earlier, and subsequently have to sneak past some of the Nazis. The station consists of one of the longest, and last, pure stealth sections of the game. This area offers large amounts of options for the player to sneak through, including shutting off a generator to turn off most of the lights. Some of the conversations that can be heard in this area are interesting too, including an allusion to D6 before it's introduced as a plot device. Of course, you could just shoot your way through here as well. The game goes a long way to try and encourage the player to use stealth in areas that they probably don't have to. On the highest difficulty, the player has a small amount of health, and also have very little amounts of ammo, which means it's generally a better use of resources to try and sneak through somewhere than it is to shoot through, even if it might be quicker to shoot. Shooting through an area, you're often to get far less amounts of ammo than you would actually use to kill everyone, particularly because lots of shots will miss, but even if every one of your shots lands, the amounts of ammo you pick up off the guards are generally very small. Metro utilizes a lot of the principles that other stealth games tend to use. The player is fairly weak, they have the odds stacked against them, and they have fairly short amounts of supplies, 
However, they are given the opportunity to have the initiative, and they are also given various ways to get past things, meaning that they can outsmart the enemy rather than just outshoot them. Eventually, we find our way to Polis. While it's not made known to the player, this is the last point in the game where they can actually spend their military grade rounds on anything other than killing. However, the way that the progression of this area is set up, it's easy for the player to miss these final important vendors. This can cause some major issues with the first time playthrough, as the player is likely to be running low on ammo at this point, and can run themselves into a corner. If one of the NPCs told the player to stock up on gear, or if the player just had longer before Miller turned back up, this issue would be alleviated. As it stands, this is the last important shop and it's very easy to miss if you get wrapped up in the story. This is also the last and best place to buy the heavy armor, which costs 100 military grade rounds. The heavy armor reduces the damage that the player takes, so it's fairly useful post the polis part of the game. Both this suit and the stealth suit are also available from Armory Station, but I've never found them to be particularly necessary in the earlier parts of the game. Anyway, regardless of whether or not the players realize that they can actually spend their stuff here, Miller turns up and takes the player off to meet the council, which is what they originally set out to do. After Artyom enters the chambers, the game moves on fairly quickly, getting the player back into action after only a few minutes. Many other story-driven games would have bored the player with the details of the council's discussion, but Metro 2033 wisely skips over it, and simply lets the player know of the decision. Long periods of talking can work well in some games, like RPGs, Metal Gear Solids, or narrative point and clicks. But the Metro games manage to let the player know what's going on, without wasting too much time. While the plot of the game is quite good, its real strength is that it knows when to shut up and let the gameplay or setting take over for a while. It's also worth noting that the game follows the plot of the book fairly closely, which goes a long way to stop the game from becoming a generic video game story. It's also worth noting that Metro 2033 has no real villain other than the hostile environment itself. Eventually, we end up in the old Russian State Library. The first part of this area involves the player having to get past two locked doors. While I find it an interesting gameplay scenario, I also find it a little bit misleading. You see, the first door requires the player to shoot out a board blocking it, which wouldn't be too bad if the nearby door separating where the player is from the locked door didn't look like it should be breakable. The second door, however, is in a much worse situation. As the first door looked nearly identical to this one, there's no indication that it would be breakable while the first one wouldn't be. This makes the solution to the second door make the player feel cheated, as the rules seem to have changed arbitrarily. Shooting down the chandelier at the end, however, is a pretty cool moment. The second section of the library changes gears entirely, moves away from puzzle sections and challenges the player instead with making it through an area filled with some of the hardest enemies in the game, librarians. These guys have an interesting design as they're fairly easy to avoid but can kill you really quickly if they turn hostile. This, combined with a stare them down mechanic similar to the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who, make these guys some of the most terrifying enemies in the game. Generally, they can take up to two AK magazines to put down, which makes running away often a better and more terrifying option. However, one weapon, the heavy shotgun, completely turns these guys into a joke. This weapon is freely available from Armory Station, and if you have the ammo, can kill these guys in a number of seconds. This can completely ruin one of the most tense gameplay moments in the game. I believe in the Redux version of the game, the heavy shotgun's not actually available until after the library, which is one of the few changes that the Redux version made that I actually improve of. The latter half of this area sends the player into the decaying basement of the library, which adds some extra challenge of traversing the old and rickety terrain in addition to attempting to not wake up the sleeping librarians. After collecting some documents that detail the location of D6, we meet back up with Miller and the other rangers, and head off to a church which is apparently the only above-ground outpost. I find it interesting that the game goes out of the way to say this, as the Nazis clearly had an above-ground outpost earlier in the game. The outpost wasn't even a new thing anyway. It was originally manned by the people of Hull Station, as evidenced by the radio at the top. While it doesn't matter that much, I can't help but wonder why this seemingly obvious error was overlooked. Anyway, here we get to the last real passive conversation that we get to listen to. Have a listen to it, I really like this one, and it gives a large amount of insight into how the early days of the apocalypse played out, without droning on about it. But those bunkers were the first to be hit. First to directly target civilians. Nobody thought this would be the war that would end it all. As I was monitoring the radio, I picked up a lot of weird stuff in the beginning, too. Siberia was silent, but the others did transmit, including the strategic nuclear subs. 
Subs kept waiting for orders. Should we hit him? No one could believe Moscow is not there anymore. Naval captains wept like kids on the air. The crewmen were begging me to check if their families were among the survivors. But I couldn't do anything. Some of the sub crews decided to get their revenge and went to their launch positions. Others reasoned that since the world was doomed, more killing was pointless. The subs continued to come back on Earth for a long time. They could stay submerged for half a year at least. Some of them were destroyed, but not all. I still shiver when I remember those things. I find that the way it's told really puts chills through your spine. While at the church, the players also offered a selection of weapons and a small amount of ammo. The effect of this act is threefold. Firstly, it gives the player the chance to switch to a weapon that they might prefer and stock up on some ammo. Secondly, it gives the player a sense of the scope of the rangers, as they are the only faction in the game that seemingly has enough resources to give gear out to Ardium for free. Thirdly, it gives a sense of finality and it feels like the player is nearing the end of the game, and gives the idea that the biggest challenge is about to present itself. Upstairs, the player has the option to talk to Khan again, who reiterates what he said earlier. Khan's standing in front of the ornate walls of the Orthodox Church, while what sounds like singing monks in the background makes a really nice scene. I find it fairly important that the game takes this time to reiterate its points about seeing things from other perspectives and thinking about them before judging them, as it comes in later when the game's endings take place. After all has been said and done in the church, the player and the rest of the rangers move off towards D6. The flamethrower part of this, I feel, earns its place far better than the mounted turret section from earlier, as it has both a greater feeling of desperation and helps add to a climactic feeling to what is really the beginning of the end. Our team and the rangers then get into a couple of frantic firefights on foot, and these really start to strain the player's ammo count. I feel that this area has been executed fairly well, as it keeps the tension high throughout, which I feel is actually a pretty impressive feat, considering that the player is being accompanied by quite a few rangers. The player's backup runs the risk of trivializing the run, as the player could feel safe and secure if these guys work too well. However, some clever AI design prevents this from happening. Soon enough, the player ends up separated from the rest of the group, and has some more quiet, but tense tunnel clearing. The Nocellises here are tougher than the ones in the rest of the game, which makes the player, and their now by large arsenal, feel less in controls than they otherwise would be. Tight dark corridors, and some scares straight out of Alien also serve to keep the tension and spooks high. The breakable doors from the library return here, hiding some goodies in hallways. Thankfully, they're less of an issue than before, as the player's probably already learnt by now that they can actually break these. Eventually, we reunite with the rangers and head off into D6 proper. The use of thick fog and ambient lighting go a long way to make this area live up to the mysterious, long-forgotten facility that it's supposed to be. The fact that D6 has functioning electronic trains clearly shows that this area is very different from every other part of the metro, which also helps make it live up to the legend. After turning on the gas filters and experiencing some power failures, Artyom and Miller head down to the depths of the D6 to reactivate the reactor. The build up to this is excellent. Firstly, the gas initially obscures the bottom of the central shaft. Secondly, the sheer scale of the shaft and the mystique of the area leads the player to wonder what lies outside their vision. And thirdly, Ullman mentions that he feels uneasy about the area below. Unfortunately, the payoff is pretty botched. The idea of a large and unfathomable biomass inhabiting the depths of a legendary facility is a very interesting and almost Lovecraftian concept. However, the gameplay for this area makes it lose almost any mystique it may have had. This area of the game consists of the second escort mission, and is one of the hardest to get through. Unlike the earlier one, Miller is killable here, and he progresses at a rate that's too slow to run past everything, but too fast to be able to deal with the enemies appropriately. Add to the fact that the player is likely to be low or out of ammo at this point, and this area easily becomes the worst in the game. The escort mission consists of two main corridors that the player and Miller have to slowly walk down, while being bombarded with attacks from these amoeba things that are produced by the various spawners. The amoebas can easily swarm the player or Miller, and kill either of them in a matter of seconds. While Miller does an okay job of dealing with amoebas in front of him, he does nothing to stop the ones from coming behind, leaving the player to deal with them. In addition, the player is almost forced to walk over some spawners, which give no indication of whether or not they're going to spit out an amoeba. An unlucky player can be killed by an amoeba that has just spawned under them, which is incredibly frustrating. In addition, 
The Amoebas are not even interesting enemies to fight. They just float around on the ground, look out of place in the realistic art style of the game, and only attack by moving forward to the player in a straight line, and then exploding. 95% of my recent playthrough of this area was spent dying from these exploding amoebas from behind, as it's impossible to keep your eyes on them at all times. What you're actually meant to do is destroy the spawners, which can take up to 12 revolver shots. When shot, the pods give no indication that they're being damaged until they just awkwardly disappear in a poof, which can lead the player to believing that they're undamageable. In fact, the player is given no indication to shoot the spawners by any of the NPCs or any other gameplay element. The only way the player can find out that they can actually destroy these is by accident, by looking up how to get through this area on the internet, or by randomly getting a loading screen tip after dying, which might not even appear until after multiple deaths. This area of the game is so poorly thought out, and just grinds against the well thought out areas of the rest of the game so much that it makes me feel like this area must have been rushed. It can get so bad that if the player only has a small amount of ammo, the area is just impossible. Forcing the player to revert as far back as Polis, killing the pacing of the game, and killing any encouragement for a first time player to actually want to finish this. I know a number of people who've just given up on this game due to the ridiculousness of this area, and it's the part of the game which always makes me reconsider whether or not it's worth to play through Metro 2033 again. Luckily, the area isn't too long, and the first corridor can be cheesed through by running ahead of Miller when getting off the lift, which allows the player to take their time and clear all the spawners before coming back with Miller. After this dreadful section of a game, we get to the closest thing to a boss fight in Metro, the biomass covering the reactor. There's really not much to this, but running to the crane and hovering over the boss creates a nice set piece. After reactivating the reactor, we're finally caught back up to where the prologue takes place. The game doesn't make the player play through what happened in the prologue again, which is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it stops the player from having to do the same thing twice, but on the other, depending on how long it took the player to get through the game, the player may have forgotten what happened leading up to this, making the player feel a little bit lost. This is another area that makes me question whether putting the prologue at the start of the game was a good idea, or whether they should have just put it where it fit chronologically. After what feels like a climactic dash towards the tower, the player and Miller make their way up to the top. I feel like climbing to this height makes a nice contrast with the rest of the game, which mostly focuses on traversing the depths below the city. The small amount of platforming that the player has to do isn't too difficult, and helps the player actually feel like they're making their way up a rickety tower. I'm not too fan of the QTEs in this area, as they have the player just tap F to make the movie play, and don't really add anything else. Well-executed QTEs make the player feel like they're actually sharing some of the effort that the character has to put in. Examples of these can be found in Metal Gear Solid, in the Torture Chamber, all over The Walking Dead Season 1, and also in Metal Gear Rising. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about how well the game manages to make the player feel like they're in a really cold, windy, and high up place. Up this high, the edges of the gas mask become really frosted, a loud wind is consistently rushing up against the player's ears, snow and cloud particles move by at a fast pace, fog and low clouds are presented in the distance and below, and everything is covered in a layer of snow. These aspects all come together really well to sell the scene. Many of these aspects are present during other parts of the game on the surface, but I feel like now would be the best time to mention it, as the tower brings it all together. It's also worth noting that the music quietens down while you're up here, to let the player soak up the environment. After getting to the top of the tower, the player experiences some more visions created by what we now know to be the Dark Ones who are attempting to stop Artyom from calling down the missile strike and bombing the Botanic Gardens, where they live. This area features some interesting, non-Euclidean spaces a la Antichamber. These areas are entirely different to other parts of the game, and are presumably a representation of what Artyom's mental battle with the Dark Ones is. Once this is complete, we get to the endings of the game, which is where the moral system from earlier comes in. Depending on how many positive moral points the player has acquired, they'll be presented with either the bad, canonical, ending, or a choice between the bad and a good ending. I won't get into what they involve here, but I think that they are both actually pretty satisfying. Playing through the game for the first time, I didn't feel cheated out of the proper ending when I got the bad ending, as it made perfect sense from Artyom's perspective, and accomplished what we set out to do by leaving Exhibition Station in the first place. The bad Ranger ending is the closest to the ending in the book, 
which is where the game sequel Last Light picks up from, and therefore is considered canonical. This makes the secret enlightened ending feel like a cool hidden extra, rather than the proper ending, like many other games with these sort of systems treat it as. Regardless of what ending you ended up choosing, with that we bring a close to Metro 2033. Computer games like Metro 2033 are the result of the hard work of extremely large numbers of people. Because of this, I'm going to let the credits run while I sum up. Metro might not be the best stealth game, be the best narrative experience, have the best set pieces or the best shooting mechanics. If I wanted to play a game that excelled at any one of these aspects, there'd be plenty of other games I might play. However, I play Metro 2033 because of how well it brings these aspects together. Metro hinges on combining stealth, combat, horror, and narrative all together, and framing it under a Russian-Ukrainian lens, and pins everything on an incredibly realised world. Metro 2033 is just as much about a story of the Metro and its people, as it is about Artyom's adventure and shooting mutant creatures and Nazis. Coming out of Metro, you feel like you might have actually spent time in its tunnels, actually met its people, and actually climbed down onto the surface, gas mask and all. Metro provides an experience that just can't be found in any other game and is really stronger than the sum of its parts. And with that, that brings this analysis to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who stuck it through to the end, and I hope you enjoyed it. I realise it's a bit of a change of pace, but let me know if you want to see more of these, or whatever else you think. See you next time.